Paul is here and you have, uh, we're getting ready to discuss your book as part of the Systemic Global Book Club and we are thankful that you are willing to come to this discussion and answer a few questions about your writings and your research and see how we can turn this into something that really impacts the global health system of community. So thank you so much for being with us here today. Not at all. Thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, excited to be a part of it and very glad that you're all um, discussing my book. Yes, I read the book about a year ago and have since reread it a few times and just really was touched by so much of the research and so much of the relevancy to the work that we are doing with children to be able to really help children succeed. So let's go ahead and get started and uh, just discussing on some of the points um, most relevant that we will probably be discussing later on in August during our book club. Great. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to touch base on is that you have researched and interviewed and just spent a lot of time with so many programs that are working towards social change and that are working with children who are living in poverty. What elements do you think make some of these programs more successful, or what elements or goals do you attribute to the most successful programs that you have had a chance to work with? Well, it's, it's definitely hard to point to any specific um, elements that make a program successful. So, so there are so many different ways, I think, to help kids who are growing up in disadvantage. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of different approaches work. You know, there, there are some that are in early childhood that work, some that I wrote about that are in um, adolescence mm -hmm. that work as well. But the one thing that I think ties together the programs that I, I wrote about, certainly in How Children Succeed, is that they address in some way this set of non-cognitive skills or character strengths. Um, that's definitely one of the big themes of my book, is that right. in both education and child development, we've been um, neglecting this side of the uh, skill equation. Uh, we were focusing very much in, in a lot of programs on cognitive skills, on the importance of developing cognitive skills. Um, and we haven't been focusing enough on these other skills, things like grit and curiosity and conscientiousness and self-control. Um, so one of the things that really struck me was how uh, the programs that seemed most effective, both, both in early childhood and in school and even in adolescence and college, were trying somehow to address that set of skills. Right, and that's one of the things that I first found interesting when reading your book was thinking how so much of creating music and so many of the goals that El Sistema has with having children learn music within an orchestra go back to those character traits, whether it's having you know two students sharing a music stand uh, and having to work together in order to be able to be a part of the bigger ensemble and just having all of these students working together to create beautiful music and all of the character traits that go into that, as well as a segue to our next topic, which are the executive functions that you so wonderfully describe in the book, as well as all of the research that has gone into what they are and how programs can help to, you know, kind of develop them and why they are really important uh, for children living in poverty, uh, what's been going on with, with those executive functions and those parts of their brain based on the poverty stressors that um, they experience in life. So could you just give us a brief rundown of what executive functions are for any of our viewers that it might be a new topic for them? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, the best description that I've heard, the best analogy that I've heard for executive functions came from um, this pediatrician, Jack Shankoff, who runs the Center for the Developing uh, Child at Harvard. And he talks about mm -hmm. executive functions as the air traffic control system for the brain. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's sort of this particular set of um, cognitive skills that organize our thoughts and control all of the jumbled thoughts that sometimes exist in our brain. So it includes things like short-term memory, um, cognitive control, uh, cognitive um, flexibility, being able to sort of see two different approaches to uh, a problem, um, not falling for, for sort of easy cognitive traps. Um, and when you think about what we want kids to learn in school, it makes sense that a lot of these, a lot, a lot of it depends on executive functions. Um, I've got a five-year-old son now, and, and he's just, you know, starting to learn how to read and starting to understand what the letters, different letters mean. And things like, um, you know, uh, sometimes a C makes a K sound, sometimes a C makes an S sound. There are a lot of, of complicated rules and exceptions that we're asking kids to keep track of. Um, that's a lot of what learning is, especially in the early years. 
And one of the things that um, Jack Shankoff and other scientists have found about executive functions is that um, when kids grow up in disadvantage or in poverty, they often are in uh, environments that are very stressful. Uh, and that stress has a um, negative effect on the development of those executive functions. When you grow up in stressful uh, environments, your, your thoughts are, are, almost, are often um, disorganized. It's hard to control them. Um, it's hard to control your, your sort of cognitive impulses. Um, and so a lot of the interventions that seem most effective with kids who are growing up in those sorts of chaotic environments are uh, involve trying to improve those executive functions and help kids learn strategies to, to sort of control their uh, the more unruly parts of their brains. Um, and so it makes perfect sense to me that that is a lot of what El Sistema is doing. I think that uh, practicing um, uh, practicing anything, practicing anything sort of over and over, whether it is a sport or I write in my book about a uh, chess team um, that, uh, that you know, is very successful and I think partly because they address these executive functions. That process of, of learning to control um, the way that you think, learning to, um, to concentrate, to focus, uh, to avoid distractions in your mind, um, those I think are all, all connected to executive functions and they're all uh, something that I, I'm not surprised comes from practicing music. Right. I, I remember kind of as I was reading some of the articles and even how you read detail a lot of the specific executive functions in the book, I remember thinking how they related to the orchestra program I was teaching, uh, whether it's everything from when we teach Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, there's the part A and the part B, and the students have to remember what the notes were in part A and part B, and by this point they're just memorizing everything, and then they have to recall that in a specific order to get the whole song. Or um, even just thinking in terms of patience, uh, and, you know, part of that, dealing with it, being able to um, control your body when the conductor is working with one section, and you're kind of just sitting there waiting for the conductor to come back to work with you. At the start of the year, my students, that, that could barely happen because as soon as I turn my body even just a little bit one way, you know, the students on the other side, the violins, would just immediately just get off track and everything else. But by the end of the year, that had gotten a lot better. Or even just having students, a big part of El Sistema is to go to concerts and go to performances. And I've definitely noticed with my students the ability to from the beginning of the year that they could barely sit still to listen to a long piece of classical music being played live. They were enchanted by it, but after five minutes it was they were ready to move on and start moving around and talking. And by the end of the year, you see that that has just grown so much that they can sit for a full 20, 30 minutes to be able to really enjoy what it is that is being presented in front of them. So in a lot of ways, that's what got my interest with the work that I'm doing as an orchestra director and then reading about the executive functions and seeing how, especially on a daily basis, those skills can be uh, very much helped out by the process of learning an instrument and even starting to understand the basics of music theory and where you put your fingers to make sharps and naturals and flats. So there's so much there that you know really just stretches the brain for the kids. And I think just for all teachers in general, understanding uh, the poverty stress and how that damages executive functions um, has made me a teacher that can relate so much more to my students. When you see a child who just has a hard time not calling out, not calling out, and is constantly talking, as a teacher who doesn't understand that, it, it gets annoying. You're thinking, why can't this kid understand that they need to be silent? And then when you fully understand what's happening in the brain, I, you know, you instead see that child as being, okay, there's a part there that hasn't fully developed and I need to be patient with that because you have to develop that part of your brain before you understand that concept. So that's how I, in both of those regards, felt this was so, um, so meaningful to the work that we do, especially overall in education. And I wanted to touch base on what you said about uh, the malleability of executive functions. I think a lot of people tend to believe that maybe like learning a language uh, after a certain age it's done and there's really not much that can be done to develop these skills. Um, but is that necessarily true or can this be improved with children even all the way to adolescence? Uh, absolutely, it can be improved well into adolescence. I mean, I do think that it's true that a lot of, you know, like language uh, acquisition, a lot of these skills are developed in early childhood. Uh, and so 
um, it, from a from a society wide um, uh, point of view, it is very important that we figure out ways to address these uh, as early as possible and think about environments that kids are growing up in in early childhood and how to improve them. Um, but at the same time, it's absolutely clear that uh, these skills are still developing um, well into early adulthood. Uh, executive functions are controlled by the prefrontal cortex, um, and the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to stop developing. Um, parts of our brain, you know, after about age eight, you're not developing at all. The prefrontal cortex is what keeps, uh, remains malleable um, through adolescence. So there's a, a neurological reason to believe that these skills can continue to be affected, uh, but there's also evidence from a lot, a lot of these programs and interventions that show that you know, there, there are lots of young people who go through really profound transformations, even in adolescence. I write about some of them in my book. Um, and uh, and I think when they go through these transformations is because of non-cognitive skills, executive functions. Um, mm -hmm. They are still learning how to train themselves. Uh, one of the things that, that I think about the most when I think about um, the connections between my book and El Sistema is this um, chess team uh, that I wrote a whole chapter about. And these were you know, middle school students, so 6th um, and 7th grade. Uh, and, and they were absolutely still um, going through these really profound changes in terms of how well they could concentrate and sit still. Um, these were kids who often, you know, at the beginning of the year were getting in lots of trouble, and by the end they would be sitting still for you know three-hour chess games, which is uh, sort of is a strain on the executive functions of pretty much anybody or your ability to concentrate, your ability. To yeah. Be. And I think, so I, I absolutely take the points you were making, that there's something about the process of practicing music and performing music and even listening to music that helps to develop these skills. The other thing that I think, um, my guess is, is going on in, in El Sistema practice uh, is the process of having a, um, uh, a conductor, you know, a teacher, someone who is actually working with you in this um, coach-like fashion. That's definitely what I found from watching this chess coach. Uh, something about having someone who is giving you critiques, um, uh, telling you what you're doing wrong, getting you to revise and, and, and repeat and try things again. Uh, that is, I think, really um, important for kids. Uh, it helps them learn how to fail, helps them learn how to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and not take them too seriously but not sort of brush them off either. Um, you know, I think kids really learn in, in both you know, music practice and in chess the right way and a wrong way to do things. If you play this note correctly, if you make this move on the chessboard correctly, um, it's going to make a difference. But at the same time, every little mistake is not a disaster. It's a, it's a, a, a stepping stone on the way to getting something right. Um, and that going through that process, I think, helps um, kids both psychologically uh, and I think also neurologically as well. It helps train those pathways so that kids can learn how to um, how to how to how, how Repetition um, and practice can help lead to uh, um, a, a much higher kind of success. Right. I agree with so many of those points and have seen it every single day. And you're true to say that the conductor, the idea of uh, giving students that space, the safety net to be able to fail and play something wrong and still feel comfortable with what's going on is, is definitely true within these within the orchestra programs. Um, my, my kids will play something and they just have to see my expression at the end and one student will raise their hand and be like, that sucked, Miss Brissetto, didn't it? And everybody laughs, but they know that it wasn't the best and but still it's in a very safe environment, you know, where kids don't have to feel bad about having to play things again. So I think that's very useful to develop that. Um, and give them that opportunity and having that conductor, generally the main teacher, who is very much motivated to just love these children and, you know, musically, but also to get to know them and uh, to really be there for them, especially for the ones that maybe don't necessarily have that kind of uh, figure that somebody that's really genuinely caring for them at all times. You know, I think one of the things that we do wrong in school is that when we tell, uh, when teachers tell students what they're doing wrong, um, that's sometimes the end of the conversation. You know, okay, here's your test back. You got a B. Um, you got you know six questions wrong, and 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 that's the end of the conversation. Whereas, uh, and that can I think be really frustrating and demoralizing for kids, and and also just often they don't know what to do with that. They just, they just take that as a sign. I'm okay. This is who I am. I'm a B student. I'm a C student. I'm an A student. Um, yeah. Whereas in in music and in chess, and I think in sports as well, there's okay, here's what you did wrong, and then here's what you do next in order to improve. 
Um, and and that going through that process for kids, I think, is so meaningful. Not only because it improves them their their skills in whatever particular um, activity they're doing, music or chess or anything else, mm -hmm. uh, but it also trains their brain to think that way. It trains their brain to think when I make a mistake, there's a way to improve. There's something to do differently that will help me. And here's um, a person, a coach, an orchestra uh, leader, a conductor, mm -hmm. a teacher who can help me figure out how to take that next step. That's very true. Um, so in touching base on these executive functions, one thing that I have been questioning for a while now, uh, which maybe you can enlighten some of us on, is how do you begin to uh, to measure or to even you know begin to say, oh, okay, well, this is at the beginning where my students are with executive functions, and this is what we're working towards. What who's been researching this or? Um, you know, how can you begin to start thinking in those terms and of evaluation to see if that's really developing within your program or not? Um, the question of, of how to measure these skills and mm -hmm. how to evaluate them is, is still a pretty tricky one. So there are, mm -hmm. psychologists do have some techniques for measuring executive functions like cognitive uh, self-control. There's something called the Stroop test where you mm -hmm. um, look at, uh, you look at, at pictures in red, um, mm -hmm. The word red written in blue, and you have to say what the word is. And you know, our brains have a lot of trouble um, getting that right. Uh, we want to say the color that we see rather than the word that we see. Um, and so you can see in a lot of these executive uh, programs that try to improve executive functions, when you test kids on those mm -hmm. sorts of executive function specific tests, you can see differences. I think that's useful in a research context. You know, I mean, I think it, to to see in a research context how um, you know orchestra practice improves kids. Uh, mm -hmm on the Stroop test, um, but for any given teacher, not so useful. You know, I don't think that's really uh, what teachers need. I think, actually, um, most teachers know when kids are improving in these, in these executive uh, functions or, or character strengths, non-cognitive skills, uh, because they just behave differently. You know, you can see how I mean, all the things that you were describing, uh, the changes mm -hmm. in students. Uh, at the beginning of their all systemic experience, as they can sit still longer, they can you know uh, uh, focus more, concentrate more. Um, so, so I, to, from my mind, looking for ways to specifically measure uh, mm -hmm. and document these skills. You know, I write in the book about a, a school that does a character report card. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are useful, interesting ideas, but I don't think they're essential at all. I think that that what makes what really matters is is kids' eventual performance, whether that's in school or in a concert or anything else. Um, and I think that that using these skills is just a stepping stone to get to that ultimate performance. So, you know, for the chess students, I think the best measure of their uh, uh, executive functions or their character strengths was how well they do in chess tournaments. Um, and similarly, I think the same thing is true for uh, for musicians: how well they perform, how well they're able to to focus. Mm -hmm. and practice. Right. Okay, well, yeah, for, there was a little while while reading it that I thought, oh, maybe I just need to go out and buy a Simon game and, you know, sit and be like, oh, kids, here's a new game and, like, see how far they get along from the beginning to end of the year. But it is very true that you can see these differences, like you say, as you move forward throughout the year. And, you know, just I guess it's more about documenting those individual, you know, changes that you see within students um, to build upon that for whenever it is that we're trying to then say these are the goals that we're developing. So one of the things that fascinated me most as I was reading was the description that you suddenly give about character, not suddenly, but that you give about character and this idea that there's a major difference between performance character and moral character, which makes sense because so many of the things that we're trying to instill within these programs, you just start listing and kind of like you described in the book, you end up with this huge list of positive attributes that we want all people to be able to develop and we want all of our students to have. But then how do you begin to put those into a curriculum or try to even teach those? So then this idea that you separated or that has been separated between these two styles of care or types of character, um, I just thought was really interesting in kind of seeing how you develop a difference between performance-based character and moral character within kids. So could you describe a little bit of those, those two types of character and, and their differences? Sure. So one of the complications about writing about this uh, this mm -hmm. field or, or even talking about it um, mm -hmm. is that the, the, the terminology is not very clear, and and different um, 
different professions, different disciplines use different uh, terms. So I've been sort of using interchangeably the terms uh, executive functions and character strengths and non-cognitive mm -hmm. skills. Um, but they're a little bit different and they're used, you know, economists like to talk about non-cognitive skills, teachers often like to talk about um, uh, character strengths, um, uh, neuroscientists talk about executive functions. There, there are lots of overlaps, but they are somewhat different. So, character, one of the reasons I like talking about characters, I think it, people, um, lay people understand that it, it means something deep, it talks about something deep in people. Uh, but the downside of using the word character is that I think a lot of people do associate it with these, um, uh, with morality, you know, with sort of um, values of a particular culture. Um, and so when when people who look at character divide character strengths into uh, ones that have to do with moral character and ones that have to do with performance character, what they mean by moral character are things like um, kindness, empathy, um, uh, caring for others, um, you know, everything from like cleanliness, uh, devotion, those sorts of things, all of which are really important. Um, it's important for uh, for children to develop this. I think every every parent certainly. Uh, and most teachers are focused on trying to help kids develop those skills. But they're a little bit different than what, what we think about in terms of, of what matters in school, what matters in, in, in successful life. Um, and so those other character strengths, things like self-control, social intelligence, grit, perseverance, um, uh, all everything that sort of is, is in that self-control rubric, um, those uh, those are what, what these um, um, scholars call performance character. And those, I think, are easier in a teaching, uh, in a teaching context, in a, an educating context. Those are easier to talk about because they're, they're skills that help students succeed, and that's really what education is about. We're trying to give students, children the skills they need to succeed. And the argument behind um, on my book, in a way, and behind a lot of the people, the, the work that I write about, is that in focusing just on cognitive skills, uh, mm -hmm. we've Ignoring this set of skills that matter when kids when, in life for kids to succeed. Um, that, that's, I think, what, what we're talking about when we're talking about performance character. This set of uh, character strengths or non cognitive skills that don't necessarily have a, a moral dimension. You, know, you can be very gritty and be gritty and doing terrible things, <laughs> um, yeah. but that, that we think that learning these skills are going to make, make any child more successful, more effective uh, at accomplishing their goals. Right. Yeah, I, it's especially, I was really interested in this idea of separating out these two forms of character, or not separating, but just looking at them differently, um, having just gone through this full school year when this was my first year with this group of students within an orchestra setting, and their executive functions, I could tell, were really improving with their ability to be able to concentrate and to really work hard and memorize music and everything else. and. So many elements of them working together within a community worked really well and really improved throughout the year. And musically, they did such a great job. I mean, so many wonderful improvements of working with these kids. And then by the last week of school, we still had issues with kids yelling at each other or, you know, saying mean things. And it's like, ah, oh, I failed. And it's just there's so many different things that we are trying with all of these things. And you say that you use them interchangeably, but the words interchangeably, but there's still so many different elements and they're all a little different. So I think that's where kind of leading into this next question that I've been thinking about is how, for moral character, is that something that you've seen in programs that is more successful, going back to like what you were saying, the character report cards where it's measured, this is a part of our curriculum, that we're going to teach these particular moral characters and you will be graded on them, versus it's just something that takes a lot of time to develop naturally as the teacher is demonstrating good moral character and you know constantly reminding the kids to not say mean things to each other, say please and thank you, or you know, hold the door open for the person behind you, all of these things. Um, what have you seen in terms of different strategies that might work better than others to try and instill some of these moral characteristics into kids? Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I, think, I think this is a... Um this is a conversation that, that you know people have been having going back to like Plato and Aristotle and uh, and a lot of religious texts like how do we make people good right how do we help help children especially be um, behave well be, be good to each other um, and it's 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 not easy and I think it's a big part of what growing up is uh, I think it's most effective for kids to hear these messages from all over it certainly helps when they hear them uh, at school uh, but it helps as well when they hear them um, in the community you know in, in faith settings if they're they're people who go to 
church or synagogue, uh, and, and also I think um, at home. I think the most important place for de development of those moral character strengths is um, is in a home environment. Um, and, and man, I do so. I do think it helps when kids are hearing these messages from all over. Uh, we have to accept that kids are going to make mistakes and act selfishly and act rudely and act mm -hmm. mean once in a while, but that that they're eventually, uh, we hope, learning uh, on a path to learning better behavior. Um, but I do think that that. For, for any educator or teacher to take that on as, as their full responsibility um, is, it, I don't think it's going to work. I think a teacher can be part of that process of helping give kids this sort of moral guidance, but I don't think it's, it can be um, absolutely teachers' jobs. Um, and, and so I do think that um, I, I, the, one, the one thing that I do think uh, teachers can really help with is that I do think that there is some um, overlap, in, in like for instance in self-control. Uh, that as kids are developing these uh, cognitive self-control skills mm -hmm. that they're learning from practicing music, um, they can often draw on those same skills to learn how not to, you know, punch your friend when he's being mean. Yeah. Um, there's, they're different, but there's something connected. There's, mm -hmm. there's the, the ability to, to override your first impulse, uh, to take a deep breath, to think again, to, to sort of retrain yourself. Um, and I think talking to kids about it in that context, not just like, you know, don't hit your friend because that's bad and you're a bad person mm -hmm. to do it, but instead like to say, well, you know, you're up, it makes sense you're upset, and it makes sense you're, you know, you're freaked out by whatever just happened. What sort of strategies can we use to calm your brain down? Can we take a deep breath? Can we count to ten? All of those, uh, getting them to think a little bit, you know, metacognitively is this term that psychologists use, to think outside themselves, to think about their thinking process. Um, that helps, I think, in orchestra practice, and it also helps in terms of just behaving better. Uh, but I do think it's important to recognize this is a long, a lifelong process um, of how to get kids to behave more morally, uh, and and we're all still on that path as well, trying to behave more morally ourselves. Sure. Uh, when can see us uh, working on that, when they can see good examples of positive behavior in their lives, that certainly helps a lot as well. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Tuff, for coming in and for agreeing to be a part of this process. And we will definitely keep you updated as our discussions go for how children succeed. I know I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussions of my colleagues and hearing what they have to say about elements of the book. And just very thankful that you agreed to, uh, to have this discussion and interview and help answer some of our questions as we go along. So thank you. Thank you. I'm really uh, pleased with, uh, excited by what Elsa Stem is doing and, and pleased that my book is a part of this conversation. So thanks for including me and uh, yes, please do keep me posted. Will do for sure. Thanks.